You couldn't even see the floor. I was never unhappy with the food. For example, we even had expensive food like cow tongue and lots and lots of fancy stuff. I remember it well. Morale among the crews was strong, but Japanese high command was not as jubilant. In the three years since the I-400 project began, the state of play in the Pacific had changed. America now dominated the region, and the original mission of the subs, to bomb U.S. cities and instill fear of a Japanese invasion, was outdated. They just didn't have enough firepower. With each sub carrying three planes and each plane carrying only one bomb per flight, they could do little real damage. By comparison, Nazi bombers dropped an average of 330 bombs per night for 57 nights during the London Blitz. And still, the British didn't surrender. With a conventional bombing raid on US cities out of the question, the Japanese needed another mission for the I-400s. They considered all options. As the Japanese were becoming frantic for any means of inflicting more pain on the United States in an effort again to slow our advance or get us to negotiate a peace, the Japanese considered using germs against American cities. This was discussed and the obvious means of delivering these would have been by submarine launched aircraft from the I-400s from other submarines. In the spring of 1945, Vice Admiral Jisaburu Ozawa proposed a top secret controversial plan. He suggested using the Serons to unleash biological weapons on the U.S. West Coast. Such an attack could kill thousands and create panic across America. Japan's biological weapons program was not new. Under the command of a military doctor named Shiro Ishii, a secret team had been experimenting on the Chinese since the 1930s. Plague-infested fleas bred in their lab had been unleashed into Chinese villages. They'd infected prisoners with anthrax and cholera. And they had injected men and women with venereal diseases. As many as 200,000 Chinese died as a result of these horrific experiments. The Japanese army was doing a lot of work on this in Manchuria in pretty awful circumstances, actually. And certainly the Japanese Navy seems to have been interested in the use of anthrax in bombs. And the most radical elements within the army or the Navy would advocate such a, a well, yes. I would say, insane plan. There was little doubt that biological weapons dropped on an American city could cause enormous casualties. And so panic among the American population far more effectively than conventional bombs. But a month later, cooler heads prevailed. General Yoshijiro Umetsu of the Imperial Army canceled the operation and declared germ warfare against the United States would escalate to war against all humanity. With a biological attack off the table, the Japanese high command found a new mission for the I-400s, an attack on a key strategic target. The Panama Canal was absolutely crucial to the transferring of the uh, uh, Atlantic naval forces mm -hmm. to the Pacific Ocean. So the Which Panama is why the Japanese wanted to attack it. Well, exactly. of course, and we understood that. Any logical military scenario would want to attack the Panama Canal. If Japan could take out the canal, it would bring ship traffic to a halt and force the Allies to use the much longer route around Cape Horn. Japanese military planners and intelligence experts worked together to map out the attack. The plan went something like this. 
that this flotilla of submarines, uh, four yes. submarines carrying ten aircraft, would come, keeping a due distance, Very having far, come a long way, way across, across the Pacific. The Pacific. Yep, 8,000 8, miles. miles or so, yeah. Until they come to their launch point off Ecuador. Roughly about there. Mm -hmm. And then they surface and they launch their planes, their six aircraft, as quickly as they can. And so as to surprise the enemy completely, they go off in completely a different direction. They fly across Colombia. All three of them. Then they turn sharply over the west. here. Yeah. And then suddenly, and um, they perhaps dive to low level, they come down here towards the canal and hit it on its northern end in the locks here. Yeah. The mission would be extremely hazardous for the I-400 fleet. Before striking the canal, the subs would have to navigate through waters swimming with Americans. By the summer of 1945, essentially the Pacific was an American lake, and so that meant it would be relatively difficult to get any kind of vessel safely into the area of the Panama Canal. But the Japanese did have one ace up their sleeves, a secret technology that the I-400's designers had borrowed from the Germans, a technology that could help them elude enemy sonar. Sonar works by bouncing sound waves off hard objects like ships. By measuring the time it takes for sound waves to travel to the target and back, the system can calculate its location. But the I-400s, like some German U-boats, were equipped with a new stealth shell designed to absorb sound waves instead of reflecting them. Called an anechoic coating, was made up of rubber and asphalt tiles that dampened the sonar fingerprint of the subs as they slid through the water. These anechoic coatings did work remarkably well, and their details are still highly classified. For the I-400s, getting across the Pacific undetected was only step one. Their targets, the Gatun locks on the Panama Canal, were heavily guarded by anti-aircraft guns. The Ceyrons could come in above the gun's range, but that would make hitting the targets almost impossible. Those locks, the walls, were incredible structures of reinforced concrete that at the base were 50 to 60 feet thick, at the top maybe 8, 10, 12 feet thick. The gates themselves may be 90 feet wide, they were 6, 7, 8 feet of steel thick, but from 13,000 feet they would have looked like just a hair from that kind of altitude. The challenge of high-altitude bombing is easy to see. When a B-29 outfitted with a World War II-era bombsite drops a half dozen water bombs on a stationary target in the California desert. Not a single bomb hits home. The closest lands more than 500 feet away. For a target like the Gatun Locks, anything less than almost a direct hit within a foot or two or three of the target would be a waste of energy. Given the relatively primitive uh, bomb sites that the Japanese were using, their chances of being able to hit a target like that were, were pretty slim. And with only six planes carrying one bomb each, the Japanese knew there was no room for error. Keeping with Japanese military tradition, a decision was made to turn the attack into a one-way trip. The pilots were ordered to go kamikaze. By that point in time, just about all Japanese air missions were being flown as kamikaze missions, one-way missions, and the plan was to do the same here. Given our lack of resources at the time in Japan, we had no choice but to go kamikaze. I know it is controversial. Some people are against it. But I think we had no choice at the time. We knew we probably couldn't hit the target even with multiple bombs. So going kamikaze was our only chance. The I-400's crews prepared for the Panama Canal mission. But the window of opportunity for the strike was closing fast. 
By the spring of 1945, America was already deciding on potential targets for the atomic bomb. Then the war arrived on Japanese soil when Allied forces invaded the island of Okinawa. Eighty-two days of brutal fighting left more than 100,000 Japanese troops dead and thousands of aircraft and combat ships destroyed. Vice Admiral Ozawa realized that a raid on the Panama Canal would be too little too late. The majority of American forces were already in the Pacific. So Ozawa changed the I-400's mission yet again. The new target was Ulithi Atoll, a staging area for the massive U.S. fleet preparing to invade Japan. Ulithi was the likely base for the units that attacked Okinawa and perhaps also those that were to be sent for the final confrontation on the mainland. Supplies were probably sent from there as well. In the photo, I saw several U.S. aircraft carriers. Headquarters ordered us to attack as many of them as possible. Three and a half years after the I-400s were conceived, the two giant subs were finally ready to engage. They traveled separately, with orders to rendezvous off Ulithi, where they would be joined by two smaller subs. Once they reached their target, six Seirans would be launched in a kamikaze attack. To deepen the surprise, Commander Arizumi ordered the crew to disguise the bombers with U.S. markings, a clear violation of international law. Pilots themselves objected to having the planes painted in American colors. They mm. felt it was dishonorable. Oh, uh, yes. And they were ready mm -hmm. to die. They knew they weren't coming back. What they didn't know was that their mission was once again short on time. Four days before the I-400 set sail, America had successfully exploded the world's first atomic bomb. A second bomb was already on its way to Japan. To make matters worse, Arizumi's mission was plagued by problems. On the way to Ulithi, one of the smaller subs was spotted and sunk by a U.S. warship. All 140 crewmen perished. Then, in an effort to avoid enemy ships, Arizumi decided to change his route and the agreed-upon meeting point. But the message never got through to the other ships. And they missed the rendezvous. As the I-400 and I-401 scrambled to regroup and renew the attack, shocking news came over the radio. The American superweapon had blown the war wide open. On August 6, 1945,